going to first remind ourselves about the idea of a derivative and the formal definition of a derivative and, and what does it mean. So first let's take the function f of x equals x squared. And let's graph that function. We know that the f of x equals x squared has to be a parabola that goes through the origin. And we have some different points on this graph. And if I wanted to know the function value of those points, I could simply plug them in. So the function value at negative 1 would be negative 1 squared, which is 1. And the function value at 0 would be 0. The function value at 2 would be 2 squared, or 4. And the function value at 3 would be 3 squared, or 9. Those are the function values. That's where our function is located at any given point. But now let's talk about the slope of the function. And so as we look at these different points and what's happening at those different points, we have different slopes. Remember, slope is the steepness of the curve. It's the rate of change. At negative 1, we have a slope that is a negative slope. At 0, we have a horizontal slope. At 2, and at 3, we have positive slopes, and the slope is getting steeper as x gets larger. Now, what is the actual numerical value of the slope? So let's, let's review how we would take this function and find the slope. So to find the derivative, which remember we call f prime of x is the derivative, we're going to use the formula f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, and we take the limit of that as h goes to 0. So let's go ahead and find the a review using the formal definition of derivative to find a general slope formula, and then we could plug in. One of our other options would be to plug in, if I wanted to focus on the point 2 comma 4, we could plug a 2 in for x instead of leaving x as x. But let's go ahead and everywhere, we, um, right here in this function x, we're going to be plugging in x plus h and then also x. So our first one is x plus h squared minus just x squared all over h. Now to find the derivative of this, we have to FOIL or multiply that all out. So we get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared. Be extra careful with that minus sign, especially if there's more than one item behind it. When that happens, the x's are gone. We can factor out an h up top and that gives us 2x plus h. Now the h's cancel, and we're just taking the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. We find the limit by plugging in 0 unless it's undefined, and so my derivative formula for the function x squared is going to be 2x. So if I want to know the slope of any of these, uh, the slope of the curve at any of these points, then I'm going to plug the x value of the point into 2x. So if I plug a 0 into 2x, I get the slope is 0. Or we would write f prime of 0, oops, I wrote an x, f prime of 0 equals 0. The slope at negative 1, so f prime of negative 1 equals negative 2. So the slope of that little red segment right there where it hits negative 1 is negative 2. Over here when I plug in 2, I get a slope of 4. And we would expect this to get steeper when I plug in 3, we get a slope of 6. 
So this f prime of x equals 2x is a little formula or function that gives us the value of this slope at any point on our curve. And so you can simply plug in the different values you need. I want to focus specifically in on this point 2 comma 4. And I want to talk specifically about this little red segment here which we call a tangent line. A tangent is a uh, segment or line that touches a curve at exactly one point. And that tangent line is touching only at the point 2 comma 4. Okay, so what we just did on the last slide is we really answered what is the derivative of the curve at any point. And so we came up with a formula that the derivative of this curve at any point is 2x. And so if we wanted the slope at many points, we could simply plug in our x value into this equation for the slope. So when you have, when you're trying to get a feel for the slope as a big picture, then you can look at its equation. Or, as I mentioned, we could have found just the slope at one point by using the formal derivative. And I think I'll backtrack up top here and show you that. But to wrap up this discussion at the bottom is to find the slope or the derivative at any point, you use the formula. You plug in to the function, the f of x plus h and the f of x, and you simplify this and you take the limit as h goes to zero. This is going to give you a formula for the slope of the curve. And we'll be spending a lot of time talking about what the graph of these look like compared to the graphs of the original function. So what does the graph of the derivative look like compared to the graph of the original function? Because I hope what you recognize in this case is that the graph of the slope, remember this is your slope, that the graph of that is simply a line. Now that doesn't mean, uh, that's a crooked line, but that doesn't mean that my slope of my function, remember my function, was a parabola. And remember over here we had negative, here we had zero, and here we had positive slopes. Well, if you take a look at this graph right here, this is telling me that at x equals zero, my slope equals zero. And this piece right here is saying when x is positive, my slope is positive. Because remember our y values here are not function values, they are slope values. And this area down here is saying when x is negative, then m is negative. So the graph of the slope can tell us a lot about the function and we'll be spending quite a bit of time with that. Let's go back for a second and really take a look at what if I only wanted the derivative at x is 2. So remember my original function is x squared. So now I'm going to do f of, instead of x plus h, I'm going to do 2 plus h minus f of 2 all over h and the limit as h goes to zero. So when I plug into x squared, I would get 2 plus h squared minus 2 squared all over h. If I FOIL that out, I get 4 plus 4h plus h squared minus 4 all over h the fours would subtract. I could factor out an h and get four plus h left over all over h 
the limit as h goes to zero of four plus h equals four. And that's exactly what we found on the last screen, is that f prime of two was equal to four. So if I knew that I only wanted one point, then I would want to use this method. But if I knew I wanted to look at the whole curve and the slope at many places, which is normally what we do, then we want to use the method that we used on the last screen. Let's take a look at another graph that isn't quite as simple as the uh, quadratic that we were using earlier. What about y equals 1 over x? Let's take this opportunity to make sure that you are comfortable with the use of your graphing calculator. It will be important to understand how to use your calculator and what it will do for you. So let's make sure that we're comfortable with graphing. So by doing that, let's go with, um, to graph, you go to y equals, and then you type in your function. So one divided by x. Now do you see where I'm pointing my arrow? Right next to the alpha button is where you'll find your x. Okay. And hit enter. Now, depending on what you've been doing on your calculator, it's a good practice to hit the zoom button and hit number six for standard. Because what that does is it makes sure that your graph kind of gets r rid of any weird settings. And so you can see here that my graph looks a little um, uh, tight around the axis. We might want to change our window a little bit so we can see it better. Instead of going from negative 10 all the way down to 10, perhaps we could go from negative 5 to 5 so that we can focus in right on that area. So let me go to window. Let's change our x values to negative 5 and positive 5. And let's change our y values to negative 5 and positive 5. Once we've changed our window, you can see it showing up over here in the middle of my screen, but I will then, you would have to hit graph. And now we get a little bit better picture of what this graph looks like. Notice that the x-axis and the y-axis um, are a bit of um, asthmatopes, vertical and horizontal asthmatopes. Now, we want to talk about what the slope of this curve is at some different points. So you can see on this right side here that it starts rather steep, comes down, and starts to flatten out. So we should expect the slope uh, to approach zero as we go to where x gets very, very large or very, very small. All right, so let me draw that sketch right here. So it looks something like this and like this. Okay. And we have a point, for example, we might want to know what the slope is there at 2, or we might want to know what it is here at negative 2. So we might focus in on those two points. I just picked them randomly. Um, as we look at the slopes, notice that they both are negative. And if I did a good job with my drawing, they actually should look parallel. They should look like they are the same slope. But let's do this mathematically and see if that's how it turns out. So to find the slope, we're going to have to do f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, and don't forget the limit. So this one, we're going to be plugging into this, so it's going to get a little bit messy, as you can imagine. So first, we have to plug in x plus h in for that x, so it's 1 over x plus h, minus the original function, 1 over x, all over h, and I'm going to write the limit at the end. Now, I would suggest that we write this like this. 1 over x plus h minus 1 over x, that's the top. And instead of dividing by h, let's multiply that by 1 over h because we're going to have a, conf a complex fraction go in here. The next thing we have to do is get common denominators for this. And our common denominator would be x plus h and x. 
So we need to multiply the first one by x. We need to multiply the second one times x plus h. And now we have our common denominator. Be careful when we go to clean that up because this minus sign goes to that entire numerator. So when we do that, we technically get x minus x minus h all over x times x plus h. The x's will subtract out and we're left with negative h over this times 1 over h. And now these h's can cancel and so we're going to have to take the limit as h goes to 0 of 1, oops, negative 1, over x times x plus h. And so we plug a 0 in for h and we get negative 1 over x squared is our derivative. So first of all, let's talk about what this tells us. We have a negative 1 on top, we have an x squared on bottom. The x squared is always going to be positive, which means that negative 1 is always going to be negative. This tells us that the entire function has a negative slope. The entire function has a negative slope. And so when I look at this picture up here, everywhere I draw a tangent line, it better be going in the negative direction because this function has a negative slope everywhere. Now, also we have to state that x cannot be 0 because 1 over x squared is undefined at 0. So that would tell us that there is no slope at 0 and that in fact is because there's no function at 0 because 1 over x has, uh, is also undefined at x equals 0. So then let's answer the question about um, the points x is 2 and x is negative 2. So if I find the derivative of negative 2, I'm going to plug in a negative 2 to the, for x and I get negative 1 fourth. If I do the same thing for 2, I'm going to get the same exact answer. So there are two points on the curve that are going to have matching slopes. So at 3 and negative 3, we would have the same slope. At 5 and negative 5, we would have the same slopes throughout this function. And that tells me a lot about this function if I'm trying to figure out what it's doing. Remember, calculus is about answering the question, where are you going and how fast are you getting there? We like to also talk about, well, what are you doing um, or, or how are you doing it? So we can use the idea of slope uh, or the idea of the formal definition of the derivative to help us understand how fast something is growing or how fast something is progressing along its path. Okay. So there, we've talked about derivative in quite a few um, terms, so let's make sure that we talk about the ways that in which we can write the derivative. And remember, it's a function that describes how another function is changing. One way to write it is y prime. The best way to write it is the one we've been using, which is uh, f of f prime of x equals. If you've taken a lot of chemistry, you might have seen something dy dx or delta y over delta x. Delta means to change or amount of change, and so that, that's how chemists often write it. But dy dx is how is y changing with respect to how x is changing. That's what that means. How is the value of y changing if x changes? Another way we write it is df dx. We don't see that very often, but that's asking how is the function changing as x changes. Remember the y value is the function value. And there are others that we may encounter along the way. Okay, so before we go to the next little segment, let me recap. The formal definition of the derivative 
gives you an equation for the slope of the curve at any point. You can find it by leaving the x, so you can come up with a formula for the whole curve and then plug in points, or if you only want the derivative at one point, you can plug that in at the very beginning. Also, if you look at the graph of the function, you should get a feel for whether the function has negative slope or positive slope or zero slope, and you should be able to correspond that to what you find when you get the derivative. In our last example, there, the derivative was only going to be negative, and our graph, in fact, did only have negative slope throughout. Next, let's talk about what if we don't take the derivative of an entire function? What if we're looking at a derivative from a certain direction or as well um, during, in a certain interval? So we're going to look at a few things here. It's very similar to the idea of uh, limit from the left and limit from the right. We'll, we'll talk about that. So first of all, we could say that I only want to take the right-hand derivative. In other words, I want to know what the derivative of my function is as I approach from the right. So if you remember that idea of limit, the limit as h approaches 0 from the right. Likewise, I could approach from the left. And the, so the left-hand derivative is what happens to my function as I approach 0 or a number, and 0 is just an example, but as I approach a number from the left. And only when the right-hand derivative and the left-hand derivative are the same is there a derivative. So if you remember the limit from the left had to equal the limit from the right in order for there to be a limit. Derivative, same exact way. The right-hand derivative has to equal the left-hand derivative in order for there to be a derivative. If my function's doing something weird where things are um, not approaching the same slope from both sides, then we've got problems with our function, and that's an important thing to know if our function represents how our company is doing. Now think too about how this all ties into continuity. Continuity had to do with the fact that not only was there a limit, but if there was a limit and that limit equaled the function value, then we said that it was continuous. And so then the idea of, well, what does derivative mean? And at the very end of this lesson, we're going to kind of hold the answer to that. And in a minute, we're going to talk about, well, what does it mean if we then have a derivative? Does that help us with the idea of continuity at all? So we're going to revisit that in just a second. Let's take a look at y equals the absolute value of x and explore the concept of this whole idea of the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. If we go back to y equals, we clear this first uh, graph, so I just hit clear. Now we need absolute value. Absolute value is under the word math, and it's over under number. So if you hit your right arrow key and go over to number, and number one, ABS, is your absolute value, so just hit enter, and then hit X. So it's going to take, and close your parentheses, so it's going to take the absolute value of X. And now let's graph that. And so our graph is a V looking thing. Remember absolute value means always positive, so it's taking the, the negative values of X and turning them positive. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. And let me draw that sketch. Now, we do not have a way to take the, we can't do the derivative formula of, if we, if we wanted to take the derivative of this using the derivative formula, we would have to plug in x plus h, we would have to plug in x, and then we would have to take the limit. Well, there's not a lot you can do here mathematically, but we can certainly look at this graphically. What we have to recognize is that, in fact, our function has 
two graphs or two pieces. Over here, the equation of this line is just y equals negative x. And the equation of this piece is y equals x. So if you remember absolute value, this value right here could either be negative or positive. So let's talk about the left hand side and let's talk about the right hand side. The left hand side has the equation y equals negative x. The right hand side has the equation y equals positive x. You could now take each of those individually and plug them into the derivative formula uh, like we did a few minutes ago. Or what I would hope you would say is, I know the slope of this is always negative one. So the derivative or the slope here is negative one. And over here, the derivative or slope of this is always positive one because they are lines. Now, the left hand side of this is for all x's from negative infinity up to zero. So the left hand side is from negative infinity to zero. The right hand side is from zero to infinity. If we're talking about, if we're trying to find the derivative at x equals zero. If I want to know the slope of this graph or this function at that point. Well, as I come from the left, my slope in this entire side here happens to be negative one. It doesn't have to be the same, but it's all negative. Here on this side, my slope is positive. So I have a negative one slope. This is a left hand derivative equals negative one. From the right, I have a right hand derivative of positive one. So as I approach zero on this side, the slope of these tangent lines on the right side are all positive one. My left hand derivative does not equal my right hand derivative, so I have no derivative at x equals zero. I have a derivative everywhere else, but I do not have one at x equals zero. And that might seem a little strange because this is a continuous function and it has limits everywhere, but in this case it doesn't have a derivative. And we're going to talk about why that is the case or what are the, what are the, how do we know we don't have a derivative. So that was an example of one that looks like a tono, totally innocent function that ended up not having a derivative. So when does an, a function not have a derivative? The first one is that a function does not have a derivative when the left hand derivative does not equal the right hand derivative. The second time that a derivative will not occur is when the secant, which we're hoping eventually becomes what is called a tangent, but when the secant becomes vertical, because remember the slope of a vertical line is undefined, or it fails to take up a limiting position. I like to call this the seesaw syndrome. If I, I don't know if I'm spelling syndrome right. Forgive me if I did not. Check the spelling on that if I messed that up. Okay, so let's take a look at these examples. Let me switch pen color real quick. On this first one, the slope, if I'm talking about this point right here, the slope on the left is a positive slope. The slope here on the right of that point is a negative slope. Okay. Those two, as close as I get to that point, I am still going to have a negative slope on this side and a positive slope on this side. And so I am not having the same slope on the left and the right. And therefore, there is no derivative at that specific point. Okay. Likewise, this next one, again, this is a positive slope. Um, this is a negative slope. 
and they're not both approaching a common slope. So we've had positive and negative before. This is positive slope, this is negative slope, but, but what's happening different here is that this secant line, as it comes closer and closer to that point, it's getting closer and closer to zero. This piece right here, it's not getting closer and closer to zero. It's getting steeper and steeper in a positive direction. This one is getting steeper and steeper in a negative direction. So they're not both approaching a slope of zero, whereas on the parabola or an inverted parabola, no matter which direction I come from, I eventually flatten out and, and would approach zero. This one, so this one, the left hand and the right hand don't, um, don't match, but also it's the teeter-totter thing. If I draw a secant line right here or a tangent line on this little point, so it just has that little fulcrum, this teeter-totter can just, as the wind blows, it can go up and down. It doesn't take up a limiting factor. This one up here, that's taking on a horizontal and staying there, but this guy can just teeter-totter back and forth. Um, here on the next one, as I come from the left and I come from the right, this one is flattening and going very close to zero. This one is not. Also the problem is, is we have a point of discontinuity and so those things cannot approach the same um, slope and so this one has no derivative because it's not uh, continuous and the left and the right are not equal. This one here just begs for a slope, and it has a slope on every point, except at this point, which is called the point of inflection. The point of inflection is where our graph goes from being what we call concave down to what we call being concave up. And if you were to draw a tangent line right there, a very short tangent line right at that point, it is a vertical tangent. And the slope of a vertical line is undefined. So this guy has no derivative. This last one is our absolute value that we talked about. And we showed that this had slope of negative 1 all the way right down to that point. This had slope of positive 1. But this is also the reverse teeter-totter effect. This line that I've just drawn, if it were just hanging by this string right here, it could teeter-totter back and forth and never take up a limiting position. So a lot of times it's extremely helpful if you will first look at the graph of a function because that's going to help you kind of get a visual picture at what the slope is doing. So let's then go back. I told you we were going to make the connection between limits, continuity, and derivative. So we started with the concept of a limit. And the limit was where was the function going. That led us to the discussion of continuity <clears throat> and, and the idea that the function was going to the same place from both sides. And then we fell into the discussion of the derivative I'm sorry, what is the slope of the curve or the derivative of the curve? If we know that a function has a derivative, then that guarantees us that it must also be continuous. So a derivative, a function with a derivative guarantees you have continuity. And if you have continuity, it guarantees you have a limit. So there are functions that have limits but they don't have continuity or derivatives. There are functions that have limits and continuity, but don't have derivatives, like the V. The V had limits and continuity, but didn't have derivatives. But if a function has a derivative, which is kind of the big thing, then that tells us that it's continuous. And if it's continuous, then that tells us that there is a limit. There's also something called the intermediate value theorem, which says that you don't have to look at the entire function. You can look at a piece of the function. So if I had a graph that looked like that, 
you could say that this entire function is not continuous, but you could also just box out an area. And you could talk just about the function from A to B. And as long as it passes all our tests and as long as you have the derivative um, for all the points in there, then you can say it has a derivative and it's continuous and it has limits. Okay, so you can talk about the entire function or you can talk about just the, a piece of the function or an interval from A to B. Now, how can we use technology to help us find the derivative? A calculator can find you the exact derivative at a given point. Okay, so there is a formula. I'm going to show how to use it in the calculator, but let me make sure you understand. It can't take f of x is x squared and tell you the derivative is 2x. It can't do that, but it can take f of x equals x squared and tell you that f prime of 2 equals 4. So it can take a specific point. It will do this in the calculator. It just can't spit it out. And then it will spit out for you that. Okay, so it goes from here to here. It can't do that middle piece. Let's jump over to your calculator and let's do that and see if we get 4. Okay, so we want to get back to our main screen so we can just quit. Notice that quit is in blue, so we're going to do second to get the blue. Whenever you want something in blue, you have to hit the blue button first and then quit. And if you have stuff on your screen, you can just hit clear. Now let's go to math. Uh, it's number eight. Now if you have a newer calculator, it might actually do something quite nice for you in that um, yours may show up a little differently. It might actually look more like a function with a derivative and that's really nice. So you're going to just fill in the boxes that they put on the screen. For everybody else, what you have to do first, and this is described on the slide that you have in front of you, is first we're going to put in our function. So our function was x squared. So whatever your function is, you type the whole thing in. And then you hit comma. Then you have to tell it what are you in respect to. Remember when I showed you dy dx, it was how is the y value changing in respect to x changing? So we're always going to be in respect to x. We're always going to be looking at how is y changing in respect to x, comma, and now if you will put the number you want. So we want when x is 2. And if we did this right, when we hit enter, we will get 4. Now, let's try another one. Let's do uh, the function is 3x squared, and let's do it at 2 as well. So see if you remember the strokes as I stroke. Hopefully you're um, able to do it yourself. Um, and when you get to this screen, after you hit math, you don't have to arrow down. You could just hit the number 8. And so now we're going to put in 3x squared, comma, and then we're going to put in in respect to x, and then whatever x value we want. So if we want the 2 again, we'll put 2, close your parentheses, hit enter. And hopefully you're not surprised that our answer was 12 because we took the same function and multiplied it by 3, and, and that 3 affects the slope by tripling it. So it makes sense, hopefully, that our answer was 12. At this point, what I would be using this for is to check your work, because knowing how to do these derivatives by hand are absolutely critical. And so it's important for you to um, practice and then use the calculator as a check just so that you have it. What we just did in our calculator is we put in the function x squared always in respect to x and then our x value was 2.
and we will actually sh in a while um, use the graphing function to look at the derivative um, in section 3.5. Alright, so let's go back to the idea of the point 2 comma 4. Let's use our function f of x equals x squared. And what was the slope of the function at any point? We did that just a while ago and we found that the slope of this function at any point was 2x and we did the formal definition of the derivative. And so what if we look at the point 2, 4? Remember we took the x value of 2 and we plugged it in 2 times 2 and we got 4. And what is this the slope of? Well if you remember our curve at x equals 2 we drew in or we talked about this idea of a little tangent line and so at x equals 2 we have a slope of 4 which means right here the very next second this point is going to go up 4 units and over 1 so at x equals 3 we would expect that it's moving uh, and it's moving along a curve but at that exact moment it's going up 4 over 1. At the next moment it's not going to be going up 4 over 1. Okay, So this is the slope of the tangent line at x equals 2. Now why is this important? If you're swinging a rock at the end of a string around in an ellipse or in a circle and you let go of it at this point right here and you're spinning this way that trajectory is going to take off on the path of the tangent line and so if I'm studying where things are traveling when they're in orbit or, or that type of thing then knowing the path of the tangent line could be important and so we want to be able to write the equation of the tangent line because then that would describe the path in which something is going. Remember that a tangent line is a line and to write the equation of the line we have several different um, opportunities but if we use the point slope form because we won't ever have most likely the y-intercept so this form is going to probably be the quickest we're going to plug in the point 2, 4 so y minus 4 we're going to plug in our slope of 4 and then we're just going to clean up. So I have 4x minus 8 and then bring that plus 4 over so we get y equals 4x minus 4. That is the equation of that little line segment right there. And I could do that for any point along my graph. And so writing the tangent line involves needing the slope. In order to get the slope, you now need the formal derivative. And we'll be using the concept of a tangent line later um, in some applications, but it's important here to learn how to write those. So let's run back through the different big things of this section. Remember there are multiple ways to write the derivative. There's using f prime of x, y prime, and dy dx are our three major ways. Derivative is technically the slope. We like to use the word derivative versus slope, but that's what we're thinking about. And also rate of change. It describes how fast things are getting where they are going. From the derivative, we can pull information like are, is the slope always positive? Is the slope always negative? Is the rate of change increasing? Is the rate of change decreasing? Because if I'm going to invest in a company, do I want a company's rate of change to be decreasing? Probably not. Do I want them to go up and down like a, a ticket tape on a cardiogram or something? I, I might want some consistent change. Even if it's negative change, it's natural, especially for like seasonal businesses like Christmas trees, um, that they're going to have bigger profits during three months out of the year and then they're going to have low profits or negative profits during the other time of the year. 
I might be okay with that if I'm going to invest in that Christmas tree farm. But I don't want to see the whole spiked heartbeat thing because um, that shows there may not be consistency. Remember you don't have a derivative when the left and the right side are not heading to the same type of slope or when you have that teeter-totter effect where it does not take up a limiting position. To find the equation of the tangent line, you have to find the slope or the derivative of that point and then you take your point and your slope and you plug it into the slope intercept form. So we will be next making a connection between the graph of the function and the graph of the derivative and it's extremely important that you can do the formal definition of the derivative to find the function derivative so continue to practice that.